Hello, everybody. Can y'all hear me okay? Should I speak louder? Hi, everybody. Welcome to our second meeting, first official meeting without the fancy Investment Society introduction. Um, sorry for the delay start, technical difficulties. So welcome to the Investment Society. We have a pretty big schedule agenda today. Welcome. Here it is, outperforming moments. We're all going to sign in for the raffle gift card and to pay your dues. We're going to talk about that. We have some wonderful guest speakers coming up and then the traditional market outlook and sweet spots and so on. So first, outperforming moments. Does anybody want to share some of their outperforming moments today or for the past week? Anything outperforming worthy? I can share first. Um, one of my outperforming moments for the week would probably be that I went to the gym pretty consistently this week, <laughs> even though it's my day. Even if it's minor. Oh. Yes. I became an officer on my law club. Oh, Um, quote for today, I believe last week's was also from Benjamin Franklin, but this week's is never leave till tomorrow to which you can do today. Essentially, don't procrastinate. Procrastination gets a lot of us. <clears throat> so, yeah, do something today you would have saved for tomorrow. So there's that. And now the sign-in link. Um, quickly scan this with your phone. And this sign-in link is actually for only those who are in person. So y'all that I'm looking at, y'all can win a gift card today at the end of the meeting. So you have to be here in person for the whole time. And you do have to have paid your dues. I logged that completely. So I know who, who's who. <laughs> what do we pay today after that? Well, the cutoff was 7.50 p.m., like I said in the Telegram <laughs> chat. But the discounted rate is still today until midnight. But if I see your payment after midnight, I'm going to have to refund you and you'll have to pay the upcharge. We'll talk about that later. But everybody signed in for today? Perfect. And now, um, following the agenda, I wasn't here the last meeting, but some of y'all know me for those who were with the Investment Society since last semester. I am the current treasurer. My name is Ana Sanchez. Quick little introduction. I'm from the Valley, from Brownsville, Texas. Um, I'm expected to graduate in spring of 2023. I'm studying finance and computer science. And some of my current job experience is working with the Fed. I'm really proud of that. And I'm currently still working with them as an intern, a credit risk analyst intern. And some of the goals are to travel and network more. And if y'all have a goal to network more too, y'all can network with me after the meeting today so we could both meet our goals. I also do wish to teach a class with the Investment Society soon to support the Investment Society success. Also one of my goals. And now for dues. So I believe this was mentioned last week as well. Today is the last day for the discounted dues. So 25 for one semester and for two semesters, it 20 for one semester, sorry. And for two semesters, it's $35. If y'all pay that by the end of today, those discounted price will stay and I'll log you down that you have your dues paid. And the benefits are, I believe some of, someone asked in the Telegram chat, the benefits of paying the dues are to receive the full benefits of being in the investment society, which include participating in the sector and class wars we have upcoming. We're gonna discuss that in the later meetings as well into further detail and actually receiving a percentage off in merch we're gonna end up selling this semester as well. So I believe last, so last week there was also photos of some t-shirts we have. <clears throat> and also the gift card raffle we host every week starting today. Well. Is there any questions over dues? Y'all can take a quick photo of the slide. Because it's helpful. So it's either PayPal or Zelle. We don't accept cash or any other payment. And now for our guest speakers. Today we have 
Jason Silverberg, <laughs> and Elaine Bennett. Y'all can come All right. up. All right, so we have two UTSA alums from our executive MBA program, and they started a fund a few years ago that uh, they wanted to use to reinvest in students. And you know, the thought was, let's reinvest in the best students at ETSA. So you know, they thought, well, maybe the Investment Society <laughs> makes sense. So they have a new program they're starting. Um, you know, I've been working this week on getting the classes set up in the sectors. So if you want to teach a class or a sector after you hear them, they're going to really encourage you to do that. Email me. We're going to start working on it and getting that schedule down. If you're like, I'm not sure I want to do that, then that's obviously you should do it. Um, <laughs> You're like, I don't want to do it because I'm too scared. Then you have to do it because you have to do what scares you. That's that's how you're successful in life. But we have more to it than just come teach a class, get on your resume. And they're going to tell you what else you can get out of being an exceptional teacher. Thank you, Ron. OK, hi, my name is Elaine Bennett, and I want to share with you um, how this came about. Um, like he said, we are uh, graduates of the 2017 Executive MBA program. Uh, we were the class of 19. And at the end of every, uh, some, every graduation, a class decides what type of, what do you want to give back to the university or some service project? Back. And what we decided was we wanted something perpetual. So we wanted to invest, because we did have your professor, Ron, in part of our class. And he was amazing. He really inspired a lot of us. He learned a lot. So we're very lucky to have him. If you can use, you can use this information with you forever. If you can get this, if you can get this uh, process down of how he analyzes and uh, creates portfolios, makes money, real money. I mean, this is real stuff. So we felt it very important to support this. And so what we did, this is our class. We had like 38 of us. So you can see that there's a lot of people behind you and that believed in this program. And we just want you to know that um, we're very proud of it. We're proud of you. We're proud of you sitting in these chairs. We know that uh, you're taking time out of your personal time. You're not getting class credit for this. And we want to reward that. And I just hope you know how proud we are of you. And we're excited to say that we would like to then um, create a, a scholarship. And it's going to be called the Executive MBA Leadership Award. And Jason is going to explain that a little bit more. Sure. Hey, guys. Jason Silverberg, you, you, you did pretty good. And in fact, I love I love the theory of network because I'm telling you, I still talk to a lot of those folks that are up there today. And that was back in 2017. I think I, I think I gained a little weight from there. That's all right. All right. So <laughs> all right. So it's a five hundred dollar scholarship that is uh, it's given out to the the, the best student, the best teacher. In fact, that's part of what Ron was talking about. He's going to have certain things and he's going to give you opportunities to teach. Those are going to be recorded. We are going to monitor those recordings and choose the, the best one. I think from my perspective, one of the hardest things to do is to get up here and actually try to teach someone else some, something that you may or may not know everything about. However, it's the best way to learn it, honestly. We had to do it back in our class, and I think it was one of the best things we had to do. So um, really great opportunity. I, our hope for this is that it's $500 that makes a difference to you personally. It's, uh, it, it's something you could use for anything that you'd like, honestly. So it, um, any questions? Is it posted already? Uh, well, I guess for the scholarship, is it something that we actually have to go and apply for, or is it just by existing in here? It's 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 in here. It's you teaching the class the classes that Ron uh, puts out there. So that those sector classes he was yeah. talking about, that's what we're that's what we're looking for. Nice. So, so we don't have to fill out any. Yep. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Nope. Yep. We're gonna. You know, 
students in the class. Normally, professor would not be Yeah, we set this up a long time ago. I will. 2017. And uh, from our perspective, I didn't think it was going to get to the value it is today, but that, that's based on y'all were the ones that were, that were investing for us. So thanks. We appreciate that. And we honestly have never spent a dime. So this is the first opportunity for us to come out and actually do what we said we were going to do back in 2017. Kind of cool, huh? So uh, is Aaron on the call? Does he want to say anything? Uh, I think he knows how to get in because okay, deal. Okay. <laughs> so at the end, what date, I guess, whenever the graduation? Well, on the side, but it's usually the last meeting is next year. So sometime in April. All balance accounts, the scholarship, and the surgeries. The surgeries, so the board scholarship, the second board is going to be everything. No, that's the big board. So the board is going to be the rest of the board. We'll be back to present that. Okay. Thank you for having us. Awesome. All right, up to follow our agenda. Thank you. We'll be the market outlook with Anthony. Good evening, everyone. All right. Well, if you've been watching the markets the last couple of weeks, you know there's a lot of exciting stuff going on. This is kind of a little breakdown of what we're going to go over. And so for today, the S&P 500 came in at 4,521. It's up 0.84% or 35.7 bips or basis points from previous close. The NASDAQ came in at 14,465. It's a 1.28% or 178 basis points. It climbed with a bump prior to close. Also the Russell 2000, came in at 2,045, that's a 1.63% for 32 basis points. Commodities, West Texas oil came in at 89.51 per barrel. It's up 0.71% since midnight. We got gold at 1,829.30 per ounce, 0.08%. We got the 10 year treasury at 1.95. That's a 1.98% since midnight. And as y'all may know, it's been a crypto winner. Um, we got Bitcoin at 43,700. It's up from two weeks ago, but um, in the last 24 hours, that's a 0.79% decrease. It had an early spike with a large fall throughout the day. We got Ether. Ether came in at 3,092. It is up from two weeks ago. It's down 1.9% in the last 24 hours. I love Ether. Um, we got Monero at 176. This is another um, crypto with, uh, with some real functionality. It is down a negative 4.35. Everybody can hear me okay? Yes, Thank you. All right, the heat map. And so there's been a lot of um, big stories to tell, right? I think um, if you can see it very at the bottom, CVS came in at the bottom of the S&P. Um, some big going on there, um, some big hitters. Obviously, we um, Amazon had a lot to report. Um, Amazon do really well with their cloud platform. 
as they do, they're working on um, Rivian, which we'll see later on. And then I'm a spatial learner, right? And so I like to look at um, different graphs. As you can see here, you can start seeing um, what has changed in the past two years. You see growth, 34%. Now it's a negative nine at the bottom for the start of 2020. All right. And so some of the big news for last week, um, Amazon came in uh, right here. Their estimated EPS was 6.12. I believe they beaten on everything but revenue. Um, like I said, they made a good investment. We got Meta Platforms, formerly known as Facebook. They came in with $3.84 EPS. All right, another spatial graph. And so this is... Um, the earnings, should I say, excuse me, this is the earnings that are coming up also for this week. Um, as you can see, there's a lot of really good firms in there, Aramark, Zynga for people that like video games, um, Dominion, a couple of different energies. And so this is for this week. I think Walt Disney was another big story. They did, they did really great um, with their park this year. They had over a billion in re revenue. Um, they came in at 63 cents. We got Credit Suisse, estimated EPS at 15 cents, Alliance Bernstein, 99 cents, and Dominion Energy. They all opened, besides Walt Disney, Disney. And this is the earnings for next week. So I really like Badu. Um, I believe that's like the um, foreign or um, Chinese equivalent of Google or a search in engine. Um, we have Fiverr. So Badu came in at $1.49 for EPS. We have Fiverr International. They came in at a negative 45 cents. We got DraftKings at a negative 82 cents. And Bloomin' Brands, for everybody that likes Outback Steakhouse, uh, they came in at 51 cents. And so here's the big story I wanted to talk about um, is just Meta. I mean, they broke the record for the biggest loss in one day. Um, they pulled down some other people with them, but there's a lot to that story. And so I believe they purchased Oculus in 2011, which is Reality Labs. Um, they shelled out over $10 billion, um, this year, or excuse me, last year. And I believe they did like seven before that. Um, I bought two um, Quest 2s. I supported them, but, you know, the $1.1 in sales did not really match up. Um, also, this is one of the first, or really the first time ever that they they didn't gain any new users. They lost users, and that could be due to TikTok and just um, a shift in social media um, with a newer generation. Then you ask, though, is the metaverse going to pay off? Well, um, the MMA um, director, he may touch on that because there's a lot of... Uh, Everything that's going on with Facebook right now has caused a chain reaction in MMA in the market, whether they're gobbling up Bungie or other studios, um, Unity Engine. And so you might see this in your neighborhood coming up. Um, this is how Amazon um, really met, did better than on, on their average business. And so Amazon's net income was boosted um, 11, 8 million pre-tax from Rivian. And so I can only imagine that investment's really going to pay off. And so um, I had this book recommended to me, and I'm very appreciative of it. And so I hope going forward, we could all um, put on some shoes and take a walk together. And we'll be um, visiting one chapter every week and just kind of um, doing a synopsis over it, as well as um, learning a lot of good things. If you want to connect, you can follow me on TikTok for Excel tip videos or Instagram. Thank you. Um, next is Jake for the economic perspective. Hey guys, how's it going? So today we'll start off by looking at the January update on the job report. Next, we're going to touch on two stories. Um, the first one is going to be the rise of American household debt. And then we're going to look at, is this something you should worry about? Next, we're going to look at rising Russian tensions and what this means economically. There's a lot to look at in the perspective of oil with Europe and Russia and the U.S. getting involved. 
lastly, I'm going to recommend a book. This is one of my favorites. It will, you know what? I'll just wait. <laughs> Job report. We have unemployment staying at about 4%. Um, there was little change since December 2021 when it came out. But we're seeing growth in leisure and hospitality, professional business services, retail trade, as well as transportation and warehousing. In the next slide, you'll see a graph where we'll break it down. Right here. So you can see some of the smaller uh, movements in manufacturing, um, negative and mining and lodging. But the the most notable increase was in the non-farm payroll, which rose by 467,000 in January. So the rise of American household debt. What's alarming about this is been the largest increase in debt since 2007, um, estimated about 1.2 trillion, and it's boosted by high balances and home and auto loans, which this is essentially bad in a way because it's priced out many middle-class buyers for both of those, uh, mostly to secondhand vehicles. There's been chip shortages as well as, um, you know, there's so many things in housing. Uh, pretty much everything you need to build a house is increased in price. So is this something we should worry about? The Fed, uh, the data they provided, it largely states, no, it's not something we should worry about. Because while the debt has risen, um, there's been a large increase with wealth levels across pretty much all income classes, but it's been very disproportionate, uh, disproportionately spread through the classes. Good news, though, with that is that 87% of the new debt is tied to homes that can appreciate in value. So the people borrowing the money are essentially building wealth. So total consumer debt now sits about 15.6 trillion, which is um, compared to the 14.6 trillion a year earlier. And then the price of the average US home rose approximately 20% in the last year. This can be credited to, um, like I said, pretty much anything you need to build a home is increasing the price to do so. Um, some smaller ways Americans are increasing their household debt. They added $52 billion to their credit card balances in the fourth quarter which has been the largest jump on record, according to the Fed. So lastly, we're gonna talk about Russia. Um, with this, so I wrote this yesterday, and if you've been keeping up, um, news has been coming out like every single hour. So I'll touch on that, um, how some of this has changed and some things that aren't clear for us. But economists are saying that the tensions right now between the East and West are the worst they've been since the Cold, year, or Cold War. Um, many people are even calling this the new Cold War. So what does this mean economically? Uh, lots of things. So the U.S. has claimed, this is all based on the U.S. And, or the Russia invading Ukraine. So the U.S. has claimed that they'll cut Russian banks' ask, access to the U.S. dollar, as well cutting their access to American technology. President Biden stated, exactly, if Russia invades that means tanks and troops crossing the border of Ukraine again, there will no longer be a Nord Stream 2. So the Nord Stream 2 is a Russian built natural gas pipeline from Germany um, that supplies pretty much all of European gas. This comes right after the German Chancellor Olaf Scholz visited the White House. But as I was saying, some of the uh, information has changed. He's gone on saying, um, you know, I didn't really mean that. Uh, he doesn't want to, he's, he's playing the middle guy in this situation. So what this means is that European, uh, most of Europe is dependent on Russian gas. And with Russia's market-based economy, um, it would be hard to function without this pipeline. But if there's a wartime situation, Russia has many pipelines with China, therefore making Europe the most dependent in this situation. Lastly is my book recommendation. It's Coffee Land by Augustine Sedgwick. And it is the cultivation of El Salvadorian coffee and how it connected and divided the modern world. It's a nonfiction book, but it reads almost fiction because it's just crazy. There's um, talks about the kidnappings, everything that's built these countries, how they were almost built entirely dependent off of coffee. 
And it's really sad, but it's really interesting to read about. And honestly, this, this book, I'd give it 4.5 out of five stars. Uh, it's got one of my favorite quotes to deal with how trade works and how really dependent we are with each other. So the quote is, you get up in the morning, go to the bathroom and reach over for the sponge. And that's handed to you by a Pacific Islander. Reach out for a bar of soap and that's given to you by the hands of a Frenchman. You go into the kitchen to drink your coffee in the morning. That's provided uh, by a South American. And maybe you want a tea. That's poured in your cup by someone that's Chinese. Maybe you want cocoa for breakfast. That's poured in your cup by a West African. And then you reach over for your toast. That's, giving you to the, that's given to you in the hands of an English-speaking farmer, not to mention the baker. Before you finish eating breakfast in the morning, you're dependent on over half the world. It's a quote from Martin Luther King Jr. And that opens the book and everything else. Um, you see how really dependent we are on these small countries that have been completely cultivated and developed based on coffee alone. And I have a copy, uh, one copy, if anyone would like to read it. So if you'd like to connect, here's my LinkedIn and then here's my email. Some of the sources I used are cited below. Thank you. Okay. And next up is mergers and acquisitions with Juan Carlos. So today we're going to talk about the Microsoft and Activision merger, and we're going to go over the details and more. So a little bit of background over, so in January of 2022, we had uh, the two biggest mergers in gaming history. Uh, the biggest one was in 2016 when uh, Tencent, a giant Chinese company, bought Supercell, which owns Clash of Clans, and they bought a 81% uh, stake on the company. But on January, uh, we saw Microsoft buying Activision for 68.7 billion and then Take-Two, which owns Rockstar and 2K Games, they bought uh, Zynga for 12.7 billion. Backstory, okay, this is the CEO of Activision. So on July of 2021, uh, the California Department of Fair Employment were suing Activision Blizzard. Why? So they alleged that senior executives were uh, intermingling in sexual harassment, discrimination in the workplace, and more. And so they, they first started talking about the senior executives, and then it got to Bobby. So according to this website, uh, it didn't happen only once. It happened for like a long time. So it's starting rallying a lot of employees. So 2,000 employees talked about uh, they wanted the CEO to resign, but he wasn't resigning. And then uh, as the stock started to plummet uh, and more uh, employees were starting to talk about the CEO. The board started to look for other solutions. This is a great uh, graph because uh, on the first point, you can see, um, so the first one here is July 2021. That's when they got the, the suit, they got sued by the California and then it started uh, going down to so down 29%. And uh, this is a good quote. Two months before buying Activision, the gaming CEO of Microsoft said that the actions were horrific and they were evaluating their relationship with Activision to see if they were going to end the relationship or not. Or maybe they just wanted to put some uh, like dirt on the water so the price could go down because they were buying it. That could be also a theory. And this is what they said today, or no, like the day they bought them. So... Microsoft looked into the workplace accusations and determined that they were largely in the past and the, the controversy was manageable. That's what they said two months after what they said before. Their price, so these are some of the numbers. Microsoft will acquire Activision Blizzard for 95 bucks per share for 68.7 billion. And this is another thing that's interesting. The moment they bought uh, Activision, the share price was 6539 which obviously wasn't 95, but they have to, whenever you buy a company, you have to pay a premium on the, on the stock of the company. So they, they're paying a $30 premium. And at the moment it was 65 with a 50 billion market cap and they're basically paying 20 billion more, which is good for them because if maybe if Kotick didn't do sexual harassment, they could have gotten more money, which is interesting. <laughs> okay, and uh, so it's also said that after the transaction happens, uh, Bobby is su supposed to resign from Activision. 
what to consider. First of all, Carlos is going to own Call of Duty, Candy Crush, and other studios. And this is another interesting number. Uh, Activision Blizzard has over 400 million monthly active users. And uh, the Game Pass has reached a milestone of 25 million. And what Microsoft's also trying to do is pass the act, uh, Activision Blizzard's uh, people to their Game Pass. So it also merged the two ecosystems and basically make more money. More things to consider. Uh, Microsoft is also looking into, um, they mentioned that 95% of the population plays games on their phones. And even though this is already, this already exists, they believe if they uh, get with Blizzard, their, their technology is going to improve and they're going to make it easier for people to play on their phones all the games uh, that they currently own. And if anybody is interested, Goldman Sachs was a financial advisor for Microsoft and Allen Company for Activision in this merger. And this is looking for the future. This is what Phil said, the CEO of Microsoft Gaming. Together we build a future where people can play the games they want virtually anywhere they want. That's their kind of one of their plans too, to eventually make people play not only in their houses, but everywhere they go. And the last uh, quote is from the CEO of Microsoft. He said that gaming is the most dynamic and exciting category in entertainment across all platforms today. And we will, it will play a key role in the development of metaverse platforms if they're also interested in the metaverse. And that's why, that's some of their um, plans for the future. And this is my contact information if anybody wants to contact me and the uh, citations. Now, let's switch to the sweet spot. Okay, what is? Y'all need to teach me here because I have. I'm so clueless on gaming. I saw this story. I thought, y'all can see how clueless I am. I'm thinking, that's got to be horrible news for GameStop. And yet their <laughs> stock went up a bunch. Doesn't this hurt GameStop or not? Does this have no impact on them or not? It hurts. Does that impact them? It does. So why did their stock go up? I guess well, I'm not understanding. So I'm, I'm missing something so y'all can see I'm, you know, I'm not your generation, so I don't, I play Scrabble, but <laughs> much. all right. I don't know if you loaded my file or not. <laughs> it's a Word document. It did, uh, Is GameStop worth 120 bucks? It's just a meme at this point. It's like, that's all it is. That's it's just so a true. joke. Yeah, I mean, it was getting down below 100 bucks, which I think it's worth maybe 15, 20. But after this deal, I thought it may not even worth 15 bucks, but it's 120 bucks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't switch over. I'm going to do the share. I want it on the screen. I got to do a share, I mean, unshare, whatever. Oh, okay. All right. All right, just so related to what we had with the two speakers here, I want to real quickly share my blog. Some of y'all have seen this before, but I just want to real share, if you, know, just, if you want to read the whole thing, this is a real summarized version of it. But just do Professor Sweet Musings, M-U-S-I-N-G-S, and just type seven habits and it'll come up. It's a little long because I don't write short blogs because I get too involved. Um, my editor knows nothing about finance. Uh, but she really loved this blog. She really got into it. She said, hey, you got to add this, got to do this. And got really, so I, I send this to a lot of people, but um, I'm really worried about education in the United States. I'm worried about unengaged students. Um, there's students that are going to school with no intents, no intentions of learning anything. And some of them are really successful at that, um, going to class and not learning. I, I jumped on a student today. It really bugs me when I'm teaching a class uh, and here, don't worry about it here, you don't need to, but in class where they have nothing to write on, it's like, why did you come to class if you're not going to take notes? It doesn't make sense to me. It's kind of crazy. Um, and I think the system itself is very badly motivated and incentivized. Uh, I know what colleges are telling professors they want them to do. Um, and employers, I show my class, right, Tori, you're in my class. We talked about employers are saying, you know what? Do we really need college graduates anymore? And Michael, you're in there. Yeah, do we really need 
these college graduates, my word, we, there's not enough workers out there. Why don't we just find some smart high schoolers and we'll train them ourselves? And so does that mean college is a waste of time? If you go into college incorrectly, I do think it is. I think you're wasting money and time. However, if you have the right mindset, I actually think college can be an incredibly valuable experience. But you got to do the right kind. You've got to make it a good experience. So you can't be like I was in college. College students in my era was everything's on the professor. You show up to class and the professor does everything. The professor tells you what to study, what to read, and then you just do whatever the professor tells you. You can't do that anymore. You've got to take ownership of your education. And not only that, you've got to take ownership of the professor. You've got to get the professor to treat you better. Right, because you have professors. I don't know if I've ever seen, but there's a documentary called the "Declining by Degrees." I don't know if y'all have seen that. It's a really depressing uh, view of college, uh, especially one professor in particular. Is pretty, she goes, "Well, I know no one reads the textbook, so I don't expect them to." Then why do you assign it? Well, we're supposed to assign it, but no one reads the textbook. It's like, well, what do you? It doesn't make sense. So what can you do? And this is what I say: the seven habits. Students have stopped learning. Professors have stopped teaching. You know, every semester I ask students, write down everything you learned last semester and how many pages could you go? You may want to answer that question. <laughs> so I look back at my college transcript. I had 234 hours of college credit undergraduate, so it took me a long time. Um, 234 hours. So I went back and looked at my transcript 30 years later thinking, how many of these classes do I remember? Can I tell you something specifically I learned? Even if it's about half of them. But half of them I could tell you specifically what I learned in my eco class or my music history class or whatever. About half of them I had no memory whatsoever. I asked students today and they say, uh, I don't think it's even 5%. Well, so what are we doing here? Are we wasting our time and money? So what can you do to get the most out of this experience so you're not just wasting time? And the first thing is, it's not the professor that gets you engaged in class. It's you that gets yourself engaged in class. It's up to you to come to class expecting stuff out of yourself and expecting stuff out of your professor. So, you know, I remember when I was in my graduate student class, uh, I had two times someone had to pull me back because they thought I was going to beat up the professor, but I wasn't. I'm not a violent person, but it's like, professor, you're not, you're not helping my education. You're going through the motions. I was like, I was on their case. You can be on their case. They probably don't know your name yet, so you can get away with it. You know, wait, you know, later in the semester, might not work. Be engaged. Come to class prepared. So they say, read this chapter in the textbook. So read the chapter in the textbook. Textbooks are terribly written, a lot of them, but they have good information in them that you can you maybe go Google more of it. Maybe don't read every single word if it gets kind of boring, but and then challenge your professors. You should be asking your professors, how do you know that? You know, we professors have a habit of stating facts that are not facts, they're subjective opinions. So how do you know that? Prove it to me. Um, read the assigned materials, document the main arguments, go out there and look for other arguments. See if you can come in and ask a question professors that they can't answer and throw them off. I mean, that would be a challenge to do. Your goal is retention. I don't think many college students think retention is the goal. I don't think most college students think what we're learning in college is of any value. When I get my job, they'll teach me the important stuff. Everything I do in my classes, I use in my career, so it must have been valuable at one point. Uh, I would just, man, try to find a way to retain it. You have the right to challenge your professors. If you have a professor that doesn't like to be challenged, then drop that class and go find someone who's not quite so insecure that doesn't mind being challenged and switch classes, join the discussion groups. I would recommend leaving cell phones in the car or turned off completely because they're incredible distraction. I think you're better off taking handwritten notes. What I did in college, which is the reason I think I retained so much of my college. First of all, I assumed every class was critically important to my life. How naive can you be? But I just went in going, hey, man, I better learn this stuff. Secondly, I took handwritten notes. Thirdly, I went home and I recopied my handwritten notes. And then if I didn't understand something, that gave me an excuse to go talk to the professor and say, hey, you said something here, I have it. So I set it up and boy, after a few semesters, this stuff was sinking in. Uh, number two, focus on retention, not on grades. You don't need a 4.0. And 
I will tell you today, employers actually have suspicion of 4.0 students. I've had some 4.0 students that learned very little in college. And the reason they learned very little is they started off with the 4.0 and then everything they did was to maintain the 4.0. So guess what happened when they heard a professor is really hard? You think they took that class? So they started taking the easiest classes they could in avoid. And that's what employers think. If you got a 4.0, you probably got it by avoiding the harder stuff. So a, a 1.3 might not be good. But <laughs> if you're above three, you're probably okay. If you're above 3.5, you're very good. Um, they don't care between a 3.7 and 3.6. I would definitely try to get above three because of grade inflation. Uh, you can see the numbers on grade inflation. It's pretty scary how many more A's are being given out. So a three at least shows that you get more A's than C's. So that's what the three. So if you're below three, you need to push that back up. But if you're above three, you're three overall, and then maybe try 325 and 350 in your major, you're probably okay. Employers really don't notice. They're not like, well, we got 10 resumes. Let's take the highest GPA. They don't, they don't do that. So you don't, don't get, I have students that are so obsessed with the GPA. It just is killing their learning. There's going to be some professor who doesn't teach the way you learn. Just accept it. You get a B, you get a C, no big deal. I got a C. I got one C at UT Austin. He was my English teacher. Um, it was kind of a waste of a class. I should have taken a better class. I should have dropped it. But, you know, one C didn't kill my, my GPA. It was okay. Learn to teach yourself, which is what we're doing in the investment society. You know, teach a class. So you have to teach yourself so you can teach the class. Be picky in the classes. You select so you can do that because this is what employers are looking for. Um, you got to pick your professors. If it's all multiple choice questions, guess what you should do? You should be running as fast as you can to the exit, unless it's maybe an accounting class or something. Business law, all my business law classes were all multiple choice. Is that true today? 100%. That would be a wonderful class for papers and projects, but the classes are too big. So sometimes you're stuck with multiple choice. The last two years of your college, you should be writing papers and doing projects. And I don't mean group projects. I mean real, real work that you're actually doing. Group projects and multiple, multiple choice exams do not prepare you for anything. They prepare you for failure, I think. So multiple choice questions have nothing to do with finance. Group projects is you got four people. One wants an A, the other three no. The one wants an A. So piece of cake. One person does all the work. I remember writing papers for my entire team was watching the Dallas Cowboys game. It's like, okay, this is a lot of fun, but I want an A, so I'm going to just do it. Uh, I remember a professor at a conference. He says, yeah, I do all group projects because I'm not going to grade all that stuff. It's like, wow, that's real <laughs> great enthusiasm, professor. Your professors should be grading your papers and giving you feedback. They deserve, that's what they're paid for. So I've heard students say, yeah, I even on multiple choice, I've heard students say, we did multiple choice and it took professor a month to hand them back. I say, what in the world? What value is it to you to do an exam and you get it a month later? You get the exam back when? You've already forgotten all the stuff. There's no feedback. So the professors are required to do that. If they don't do it, you should challenge them. If, if they don't like it, then give them my name and I'll go challenge them. <laughs> Have y'all had that happen? A multiple choice exam takes a month to grade? Yeah. Isn't that insane? Yeah. I mean, how... You know, they have a responsibility to give you feedback. That's what we're paid for. You need to do projects that make you go through the entire process. One thing I hate about finance classes is the professor gives you all the hard stuff and asks you to calculate the easy stuff. That's not the way the real world works. In the real world, you got to come up with all that hard stuff and plug it into the formula. They're not going to pay you, you know, five hundred thousand dollars a year to stick three numbers in the capital asset pricing formula. They need to go get those three numbers, right? So. Build a quality portfolio, make sure you're writing papers, doing projects. What do you have on LinkedIn right now that shows that you can write, that you can do analysis, that you're logical, you can communicate? What do you have on LinkedIn right now? Any of y'all put your latest multiple choice exam on LinkedIn? <laughs> so I, I did A, C, D, B, C, D, A. Ah, I'm going to hire this person. Wow, look at that. Um, build your North network, which is what you're doing here. One thing I recommend, you know, get to know your peer students. Go to class early, talk to people around you. If you see someone that no one's talking to, go talk to them and say, hey, I'm just curious, your background, what major are you? Not just in finance classes, but even history or whatever. Go get to know people. 
find reasons to go talk to your professors and get to know them, ask them questions. There are professors that are burned out and don't like teaching, but that doesn't mean they don't love their topic. So go talk to them about the topic. Go talk about, you have a finance professor that's doing PowerPoint out of the book and multiple choice out of the book, and you say, wow, just, this class is boring. It's probably just because that's what they think you want. But go talk to them about finance. You're discover they know a lot about finance. They're passionate about it. They want to talk about it. And you might open another to guys and say, hey, you know what? I can make my classes more interesting. Um, so build your network. Join a student organization like the Investment Society and then start seeking higher positions. You have freshmen that want to teach classes and sectors. You know, Jake, his freshman year, taught a class right in your very first semester, right? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's really impressive. Think about an interview. Bond did a great job last semester talking about how the three things he did for society, or the four things, I guess, really. He brought that up in an interview, and he was actually showing them. We're going to do the YouTubes of whoever teaches the class. He was showing them the YouTubes from his class. I mean, that's the kind of stuff you want to do. Do what scares you. I already kind of talked about that. Um, so, so forget about being embarrassed. Get embarrassed. So what I've learned at USA, I would say stupid stuff. What I've learned is you say, say something stupid and you make fun of yourself, everybody laughs. People love people who can make fun of themselves. So, you know, say something stupid and say, wow, that was really stupid. And everybody laughs and they think you're a really great person. Is There's no downside to it. All right. <laughs> Take the risk. Go for it. The worst thing, they, they can't torture you. There's no professors that can torture you for saying something wrong in class. Um, you know, the worst thing that can happen is you get a little embarrassed. Big deal. Fear may preventing you from doing what you most like. I hated public speaking when I was in high school and college. And then I started doing it. And as I learned finance, I started discovering, man, I love talking finance in front of groups of people. And then you can't get me to, get me to shut up. I love talking because I love finance. You know, I get to go talk about finance all my whole, my whole career. Um, so it gives you great responses, interview questions. Fear can help you make decisions. I talked about before. You have a choice between three things. You do the one that scares you the most. It's pretty easy. And then enjoy the process. I see so many students that are so stressed out. Oh, my word. See, okay, I got to get this job in investment banking, and then I'm going to switch over to the buy side, and then I'm going to become a portfolio manager. It's like, wait, what if I can't get that? It's like, okay, you're stressing out about the next 50 years of your life. Why don't you just work on the next three months, <laughs> All right? Get the interviews you need, join the society, you know, do well in your classes. You don't need me stressing out. I had one student from China, but, oh man, his whole family was riding on his back. If he didn't succeed, they were, they were done for. I mean, all their financially, that poor guy was so stressed out. He was a really good student. I was like, relax, relax. You're going to do fine. You don't need to be that stressed out, but he was so stressed out. I was like, no, don't do that. Freshman year. Develop your study skills, get involved in a student organization. Sophomore year, start applying for those internships. Junior year, make sure you're getting the right classes, the right professors, that you're writing papers and then look for that plum job. And senior year, apply for that job. I've had students not apply for jobs because it's like, I can't work for that company. And it's like, why not? I had one, one of my students, um, Goldman Sachs, called her. She says, I can't work for Goldman Sachs. She was first gen. Um, and she's like, I can't work for Goldman Sachs. She didn't have any family examples of all that. So I'll just go and see. And so she calls me and says, they want to interview for me for a job. And what do I do? So I'll do the interview. Says, okay. She did the interview. Then she emails me. They're offering me a job. What do I do? I said, well, <laughs> take the job. If you want. <laughs> she was just so insecure. In fact, and she was such a great student. So I knew she was going to do great, but she was just insecure. She's there now. She's like moving up fast. I, I think they would. They would beg her to stay if she decided to go to another job. She's doing great, but she had that uncertainty. Let that uncertainty drive you and just go for it and don't worry about it. It's, it's, it's going to work out. So that's it. If you want to read my blog, you know, that's, that's it. But that's kind of my encouragement to you, you know, teach a class, teach a sector. I'm going to be there to help you out so you don't have no risk. It's not like me speaking to 50 people. You're going to have three or four. Gives you good practice. Looks great on a resume. You might win the EMBA award, which will look really good on your resume. All right, that's it for me. I don't know where we are on time. We're, we're doing okay. <laughs> Round of applause for Mr. Sweet. Thank you so much. Essentially concludes our second meeting.
for the semester, but there is quite a bit of news to share here. We do now have a Discord. I know we discussed that over the Telegram chat, so I'll be sending over the Discord link through the Telegram chat. So if you're not on the Telegram chat, come up here at the end of the meeting. Um, we do also have the gift card giveaway winners. Um, drum roll, please. <laughs> Congrats. And our second winner is with me as treasurer at the end of the meeting in a bit. And some other news we also have, it wasn't in the agenda, but we do have a new president. Um, for the Investment Society this semester. And this is due because Bennett has other responsibilities <laughs> at the side. Um, so our new president is me. <laughs> All right. All the expectations, and I know I am shaky, but I'm new to this. And I will be growing as well as the rest of y'all because we're not learning, then what are we doing, you know? Um, that basically concludes the meeting. I'm really glad everybody joined here. And to the ones on Zoom, I apologize for not sharing the screen. That will not happen next uh, meeting. <laughs> I hope everybody has a good rest of your night, evening. And thank you for being here. <laughs> you can send me to Discord on Telegram so we can all network through there. Can you share the PowerPoint? Yeah. Okay. yeah, sure. I can send it on Discord. Join in that.